Melanie are, and I are going to talk today about um, uh, really a, a, a favorite subject, which is Pewter Creek, and try to relate uh, uh, reconciliation ecology to what's going on there. But first, of all, since I don't think all of you were, were here, I want to give you a quick outline of what we're going to do, and then a little, little summary of what Michael Rosenzweig said. Uh, first off, we're going to review reconciliation ecology, describe why it is needed, and then talk about Peter Creek as a developing reconciled ecosystem, which is sort of fun to talk about, uh, and, and look at it from both the riparian and the aquatic perspective. We actually have a lot of data on the creek. Then we, what, 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 the most interesting part of this, to me anyway, is how Peter Creek became reconciled and what makes reconciliation ecology work for it, why it's such a special place. Well, first off, for those of you who missed Mike's talk, uh, this, is what, this is his definition of reconciliation ecology, the science of inventing, establishing, and maintaining new habitats to conserve species diversity in places where people live, work, and play. In other words, integrating nat natural values, natural uh, and, and, and wild species into human systems. The idea is that there's no longer a single, uh, really any pristine systems out there. Uh, and it says another quote from him, it seeks environmentally sound ways for us to continue to use the land for our own benefit. And I would add land and water for our own benefit, because in California especially, water is the big issue. Uh, and this is what makes reconcil reconciliation ecology different. It doesn't insist that we have to return to a natural ecosystem to some rest It gets away from restoration, is the idea. And it re-engineers human ecosystems to accommodate both people and diversity. And what this means is that we're dealing with novel ecosystems, just, uh, ecosystems that have not been seen before, uh, unique combinations of species on highly altered landscapes. Um, it's, it, it preserves human uses and benefits. That's just the reality. You got to do that these days, basically, um, and tries to respect human environmental preferences. It's the idea of integration, wild with human. Um, and especially, so we, these are novel ecosystems. We are, we're always thinking like we want to go back to the pristine systems. That's sort of the ideal we have out there, but you, you really can't do it anymore. So, that we'll, so we're dealing primarily with, prim, with novel ecosystems, and Pewter Creek, you'll see, is a good example of this. With new combinations of species in human altered environments. Uh, we have species in California from all over the world. Wherever you go, you see species interacting with each other, plants, animals that come from many different places. But they behave and look like natural ecosystems. A lot of the places that we had that are burned into our minds is the California landscape, like the, the hills of Cal yellow hills of California. A lot of that color they have comes from annual plants from Europe. So there's lots of things, a lot of the things that we think are natural, uh, but are really um, new ecosystems. So they're mixtures of native and alien species, and new species interactions may appear, but there is the assumption that some kind of a new steady state can develop, even though that's sort of even the fiction in ecology. But the idea is that there's a, um, uh, a, a, a state that will at least maintain itself for a while. It can be predicted and managed. Um, and on the ground, this means that uh, it considers local conditions and needs. It's very local, locally based. Uh, and it also means we have to identify the species on which to design a new functional ecosystem. We get to choose. And that's what's going on now. We're choosing what, e what species we want to have around. Uh, if we're and when we decide we're going to favor a native species, and that and may not always be the case, we can choose which ones. Uh, but an uh, important thing here is not restricted to rare and endangered species, uh, which is an often a fiction that uh, something that comes along with this. Well, so here's why we need reconciliation ecology. Especially, this is for wetlands and riparian zones. Um, this shows you what the extent of wetlands in the Central Valley, uh, riparian zones primarily uh, in 1900, and the red is what we have today. And there are just little spots of red in there, you notice. And th those ones that are left are not at all like the pristine systems that were there before, the historic systems. They're mixtures of native and non-native species. We have to work with what's left. Or if you look at the rivers, there are dams in all our rivers that block access to the upstream areas and greatly alter the areas below the dams. They fragment the landscape. They fragment uh, our uh, river systems from a fish and invertebrate point of view. So we've, got, we've drastically altered our river systems. And we are not going to go back to, to a free-flowing rivers that go from, from headwaters to mouth in most cases. 
And then you have situations like this. We have crises all the time. This is a map showing you the percent of average precipitation in the past year. Uh, you notice that this is the really dark red is um, less than you know, a very small amount here. So this says we're in the middle of a drought here. Uh, drought is hard enough on us and on farmers and on cities and so forth. It's really hard on the fish. Uh, really hard on the aquatic and riparian systems. So we constantly have to deal with these kind of crises. And do we need to, how do we manage the crisis when we have, um, uh, if we want to maintain native species? And in fact, we're not doing very well in that regard right now. This is just fish, which I work with, of course. Uh, showing that 26% of the fishes are endangered. These are I IUCN categories. And, and overall, 83 are extinct or declining, 83% of 129 species in California. Um, and this is, uh, this is accelerating. This is, the, uh, this is partly based on new information. But the first assessment I did was in 1975. Uh, and you can see the number of listed species alone, this is percentage, has gone from 9% to 24% in that 35-year uh, period. Um, Whereas, and the number of species that are vulnerable to extinction that are declining has in, in, in been an additional 53%. So this is, it says we're not doing well in protecting our aquatic ecosystems. That standard methods just don't work. It means we need a different approach. And another way of looking at that is to look at the average status scores of native fishes um, from pre-1975 and 2010. Essentially, I've evaluated the status of these fish over all these, over those time spans. And the, and the green says, at the time I thought everything was in pretty good shape. Um, the red says they're, they're, these are species that are extinct or endangered. Um, and what you notice, the green has just about disappeared from the 2010 map, where you, showing there are large areas of California no longer have uh, aquatic uh, fishes anyway that are not in some degree of trouble. Uh, and that you have, uh, some places where they're on the whole, whole, whole fish faunas are on the verge of extinction. So that tells you we're saying we're not doing very well. Uh, and then climate change, of course, is going to make things even worse. This is 83% uh, uh, the, uh, of our, our native fishes have critical or high vulnerability to climate change. I'd like to point out that only 19% of the alien species, we have 50 alien species of fish in California, only 19% of those have high vulnerability. Um, so, uh, that, that suggests we're going to be seeing a switch from <coughs> natives to non-natives in many of California's waterways. Uh, well, so this means that we have to be thinking of, of, of developing reconciled ecosystems. We really have to be thinking in terms of new systems uh, uh, and, and trying to look at new ways of developing things. And, and you'll be hearing about, one, the Yellow Bypass on February 24. Uh, trying to get uh, salmon, floods, farms, fish, and fowl all to work together in one happy family. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an interesting story, and that's also developing. Um, and another example is a place I've been working for a long time in Susan Marsh. I threw this slide in. This is Susan Marsh in January 31st, 2011, when I flew over it. It does not look like that today. Look at all that water out there. Um, and, but Susan Marsh is the largest brackish water marsh on the west coast. It has, it's, it's, it has some appearances of being a natural system, but you only have to start looking out for dikes and things. You realize it's not. Um, this is a, 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 you could argue, a system that's been treated as a reconciled ecosystem for the past 100 years. Uh, a, a lot of, a high percentage of the land is hunting clubs, which manage, the, have managed their lands for, and for duck hunting, as has the wildlife refuge. Uh, there's a major urban area here, an Air Force base, and so forth. So this is an area that has a lot of, uh, that that's, looks like a nice wild area, but it's highly managed and highly altered. Uh, and that's sort of the reality of today, more so than it's ever been before. And when you look at the fish in this area, this is, if you were a fish ecologist and you looked at these, all these pictures of fish here, you'd say, wow, that's a pretty diverse fauna. Looks like those fish should all get along pretty well because they're such different body shapes. And they do. They, this, when you when we study this, this system, these are the 15 most abundant fish, fishes. When you study these fish, they show a high degree of segregation. So they're behaving like a natural system, but you, everything for A is a non-native species. Uh, half the fish in, that, in the marsh are not natives, and yet they're interacting with the native species. Um, and likewise, they, they tend to be following population trends in a similar fashion. I won't try to explain that anymore. 
And I also want to put in an advertisement for our new book. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is coming out in March 2014. It's uh, on Susie Marsh, An Ecological History and Possible Futures, which deals with these issues in Susie and Marsh. Um, anyway, so we're going to talk now about Lower Pewter Creek. This is where Melanie uh, takes over. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> okay, so we're going to focus a little on Pewter Creek now. Um, Peter laid the groundwork about the reconciliation ecology approach, novel ecosystem approach, and Pewter Creek is a local uh, watershed here. We're all in the watershed right now, and it's been being studied for many, many years. Uh, it has a lot of challenges, but there's uh, a lot that has been learned about Pewter Creek, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the riparian aspects and the terrestrial aspects of Pewter Creek, and then Peter will come back after and talk some more about the aquatic environment and what he's learned. Um, so it's about a 30 kilometer uh, riparian remnant for lower Puda Creek. Now I should mention that Puda Creek does con continue up past Monticello Dam and up into the coast ranges and has a completely new, you know, different kind of aspect up there, different reach structure. And uh, so we're just focusing on the lower Puda Creek down here. Um, so uh, we propose a novel ecosystem. It has a lot of new um, assemblages, as Peter mentioned, and we're hoping that it can be a model for reconciled uh, ecosystems elsewhere. So just to place it in context, you probably all know where, where it is, but just to mention uh, Monticello Dam, major dam on Puda Creek runs down here, hits the <coughs> Puda Creek Diversion Dam, uh, through which about 90% of the creek's water is shunted through the Puda South Canal to Solano County. So it loses a lot of its water right there. Uh, a couple tributaries, Pleasance Creek, which is a major source of fine sediment to the creek and creates water quality issues, especially down here. And Dry Creek, which is a major source of uh, coarse material, and very important for salmon spawning and for ha in-stream habitat. So there's work being done to try to recruit more of this gravel and bring it into the creek, which because it was dammed is starved for sediment. Then, of course, the town of Winters, town of Davis. Uh, here, Puda Creek was shunted into a new channel back around the early 1900s. This was its former channel, which runs through the uh, Arboretum Waterway, was formerly Puda Creek. <coughs> Kept flooding the town. Eventually, they just shunted it south and made a new channel for it and runs into the Yola Bypass. So another thing just to mention is this matrix that surrounds the creek is highly modified. It used to be uh, a, a heterogeneous matrix of oak woodlands and uh, tule swamps and all kinds of different habitats. Now, of course, it's primarily agricultural and uh, urban and exurban development. So that makes a big difference. Lots of introduced species coming from there uh, and lots of impacts from the, uh, the land uses adjacent to the creek. So here's a, an aerial photograph of what Puda Creek is today. And this is Highway 180 running uh, across the creek. Land conversion, dams, water diversions, and introduced species have created a novel ecosystem where once there was a broad interacting ecosystem, there is now this narrow ribbon of riparian habitat, highly channelized. Uh, and everything that goes on in here stays in here. It's like Las Vegas, I guess, in a way. <laughs> So um, since about uh, 1997, the Museum of Wildlife and Fish Biology uh, has been studying the terrestrial system uh, along Puda Creek. We have about uh, 13 different study sites along the creek that we monitor. And uh, we have, uh, I want to present a little bit of information that we have found so far. Um, diverse assemblages and unique because of uh, this interaction between the introduced species and the natives. So plants, we did uh, comprehensive plant surveys in 2005 and 6, and then again last year. And we found over 250 species, about 50% of which are native. So there, there you know you've got a lot of interaction, different kinds of plant species, new habitats forming, new resource subsidies for wildlife, um, and lots of stuff to look at there. In 05 and 06, we had some students do pollard walk surveys, which are kind of like a, a tra transect that you walk and you count butterflies. We found uh, 31 species, 75% of which were native, and represented about 56% of the Central Valley butterfly fauna, 
which for one year of studies was pretty good, I think. Um, we caught quite a few of them. And a lot of these, result, these results were set within uh, widespread regional declines that, uh, we, that the Central Valley has been experiencing over the last few decades. Uh, amphibians and reptiles, we do yearly visual surveys as we're out working on the creek. Uh, we've uh, documented four amphibian species, which is only 6% of the species found in California, but it's 80% of the Sacramento Valley fauna, which tells you how depauperate the Sacramento Valley is uh, of amphibians, and not surprising considering how much habitat loss has, has occurred and probably water quality issues to which amphibians are highly sensitive to. The reptiles are doing a bit better. Um, we found 10 species, and, and these are not comprehensive, so I'm sure there's many more out there that we haven't found. Uh, about 90% of the species are native, 11% of the California fauna, 67% the Sacramento Valley fauna, and 71% of all the species found in Yolo County have been found on Poudre Creek. So it, it, it is a hot spot for di diversity here in the valley, for sure. For mammals, these are all mammals that have been found on the creek. Um, we do, again, yearly visual surveys, and we've also started doing some camera trapping with uh, remote cameras. 31 species, probably more, actually. I haven't actually looked at our most recent list, but about 79% are native, and um, about 81% of all species in Yolo County, 69% of the Central Valley, and 14% of all mammals found in California, including a few interesting ones. Um, Black bear, been found on the creek more than one occasion. Mountain lions, and then two species, oh, hey, gray fox, come back. There you are. Uh, two species of foxes, the um, native gray fox, and what's now considered the native subspecies of the Sacramento Valley red fox. For many years, these red foxes were thought to be escapees from fur farms, but they, uh, recent genetic work done here at UC Davis is showing that it's a distinct subspecies of red fox um, that's living here in the valley. So more work is being done on them as we speak. And a little bit from our camera trapping project. This is actually uh, was started by a couple interns that came to me and wanted to do some kind of a project. So we bought a few cameras and they started putting them out here and about. And we, one, the most surprising thing to me is how many bobcats are living on the creek. I kind of thought that you know they would be a little bit more <coughs> sensitive to these sorts of environments, and but they're they're living in the corridor, they're foraging out um, in the matrix and on the edge habitats and the ecotones between the ag fields and <coughs> and the riparian, uh, and of course coyotes. And I like this picture because he's kind of you know right at the boundary and he's looking out into this orchard and checking out the the situation, um, and and you know, deciding whether it's safe to go out. And I'm sure there's a lot, a lot of that going on, a lot of interactions. And then birds, we've studied the most, uh, we have most records for birds, 52,000 records so far, 72% of the Yolo County fa um, fauna, and about 40% known to su or suspected to breed on the creek. And that's from some breeding bird atlas that, projects that we've done uh, in the last few years. Um, this is riparian focal species diversity. All focal species um, for birds, riparian habitat joint ventures, focal species have been found on Poudre Creek. These are some of them. And these are some results of the different study sites where we've counted birds and the different variable uh, proportion of abundance of these focal species, indi indicators of good riparian quality habitat. And the interesting thing is the original assessment of Poudre Creek was based on this site right here. So originally they thought Poudre Creek, you know, it's trashy, no birds, it's not a very good habitat. But it turns out this was sort of the least abundant uh, site on the creek, and we've found many, many more since then. Poudre Creek is also a great um, fallout spot for vagrants and rarities. I just thought I'd show this because there's a lot of pretty, pretty pictures of birds, and these are all species that have found their way, gotten lost, and found their way onto the creek and lived on the creek for various periods of time. And then some long-term monitoring. The value of long-term monitoring is, starts to show up when you get you know, several years in a row. And the thing that's interesting here is this sort of inflection point in 2006. And we see this for a variety of species. If you recall, those of you who were here, it was a big water year. 
and we see pretty much across the board a significant response of population abundance uh, at that point. So we've got baseline flows, but we also seem to be seeing some sort of a signal coming from these big pulse flows coming down the creek. And then just a little bit on the Poudre Creek Nest Box Highway. Uh, this is a, a project that we started back in 2000 to um, integrate habitat restoration, helping species with in, uh, education and environmental uh, education for the public as well. So we have uh, 351 boxes across 13 sites of Lower Poudre Creek. These are all the locations and the number of boxes. And we, uh, the approach is we do uh, active management and monitoring of the boxes. We ban the birds out of the boxes, both adults and chicks. And we do dietary studies. Uh, and um, there's PhD work and other work being done along the, on this system. And this is just a result of some of the different species. You see different responses for different species to the placement of nest boxes. And tree swallows have been the most the most uh, abundant responders, if you will, to nest boxes, and, but other species have responded as well. About 8,000 fledglings produced so far out of these boxes. And this is just shows you, um, this is for western bluebirds, which were um, largely reduced in the, in, on the creek before we put the boxes out. It's the western bluebird on one of the pole boxes. Our first year, uh, we've, we've had one population of western bluebirds, and they produced three fledglings. Two years later, we had two populations and nine fledglings. In 2006, we had six populations and 78 fledglings. And in 12, we had 11 populations and 123 fledglings, and they're all sort of marching down the creek as the founder populations spread out and started attracting more, more birds. And now we have a pretty thriving population of western bluebirds on the creek, as just as a result of putting some boxes out. And here's the nest box occupancy changes through time from 2001 to 13, showing the increase in um, occupancy rate and, and, and corresponding output with the conclusion that these increasing populations of secondary cavity nesters shows that reconciliation management for target species can, can work, and that, it, at least in this way, the Poudre Creek ecosystem is getting better for secondary cavity nesters, at least, and we hope for other species as well. So now Peter's going to take over and talk a little bit about the aquatic system. Thanks. Yeah, they, it's, it's really amazing how so many of these animals have responded uh, as, as Melanie has shown, it's, it's every, it's, you know, when we, and I'll show you, when Peter Creek started out, we started working on it, it wasn't that great a place to go, and now it is. Uh, so it's a, a really a great example of how rapidly things can respond, but I do want to emphasize it's far from being a pristine system. And you see this in the aquatic ecosystem as well. Uh, you know, sometimes it looks pretty good. You know, you, this is a picture taken during the flows that are released for native fishes. Uh, in the spring, uh, the flows are up, it looks good, but those of you who know plants will know this is tamarisk, which is a non-native species. So it's an irreversibly altered system um, with, a nice, with a mixture of native and alien species. So it truly is a novel ecosystem. That everything in here, uh, did not, most of the things did not evolve together. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a place that you can manage for native fishes. We're very lucky, we have 10 species of native fish in the creek. Um, and we've been able to manage for them uh, quite successfully. And some of the more spectacular ones are tule perch, which was quite rare in the creek until flows improved. And now you can <coughs> snorkel in some places and uh, see dozens of these fish. These are fish that are live bearers. Uh, and each female gets, looks like a little football when she's pregnant and she gives birth to 30 or 40 young, which then swim away. It's really quite amazing. Uh, but we have salmon spawning in the creek now. This is a creek a picture taken about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, of salmon spawning right below the diversion dam. It's a big male Chinook salmon. Um, oh, I forgot to check this. Well, I'll I never mind. I was going to show a video, but I won't. Um, so the, the creek, again, that's working. That salmon were not here before this uh, uh, until the recent years. And what's been going on is that we've modified the creek in ways that now favor native fish. This is a key aspect of reconciliation ecology, you pick the species you want to, want to shoot for, and then you try to manage for them. In this case, for the aquatic system, we decided 
the best thing to do is to manage for these 10 native species. Um, and actually, that's, that's the number of years here. But anyway, so there's, um, uh, this is just in one site, just as an example. But you can see that before we changed the flow regime primarily is what did this, uh, we were at 80% alien uh, numbers of, uh, the fishes were 80% aliens, both in numbers and in species. And here, after, we, after that, it's now 80% native species. So a very dramatic shift over, this took place over about a five year period. So this is a, demonstrates that this is what you have to do. You can manage the environment, but you notice the aliens are still there. And that's just as, as here, the natives manage to persist in one particular place. Here, the alien species are still there. So they don't go away. They just get suppressed. Um, and in fact, they're still abundant in many places, which is sort of nice, because when I take the class down to the, to the picnic ground here on campus and sample there, we get this nice mixture of native and non-native species. The diversity is higher because of the, and if you're trying to demonstrate fish to students and you want students every day to hold a carp, there's your chance. <laughs> um, but this also reflects what's going on in the creek in general. These are the percentages of alien species in all the major groups. Um, there's some of these numbers are also a little bit different, but but basically what you see that all these groups have are are partly non-native species. 61% on the herbaceous plants, 63% on the fish. So this means this is a dynamic system. There's always a tension between the native and non-native species, and what we can do is is manage for the native species. Uh, so. What we have here for Peter Creek then is a biodiversity hotspot in an agricultural landscape. As, as, as Melanie pointed out, this is this, uh, I'm surprised you didn't use the word shred, Melanie. That was, that was her, her term. This is a shred of habitat moving through the, the ag landscape. This is, looks like a tough place for anything to survive, yet it seems to be working. And, and it's working in part because it is a novel system. It's a, a mixture of these native and non-native species that have figured out how to live in this very narrow corridor. And that's why it's a great test case for reconciliation ecology. Um, so how did Pewter Creek become a reconciled ecosystem? Um, well, you, you have to recognize in the 1850s to the 1950s, this was all, all the focus was, was trying to make Pewter Creek go away. Because the farmers did not want flooding. There's a lot of water coming out of the hills. You wanted that water, but you didn't want it at the wrong times of the year. So the, the <laughs> creek was levied and confined to a channel. Uh, then in 1957, Monticello Dam was built uh, to con contain the water, a very successful water project. Um, and that totally changed the creek. At that time, the creek below the diversion dam uh, became written off by the, even by, even by the, the resources agencies as a, not worth bothering with. That, that's the part we're talking about today. But in 1986, the University of California here re established a riparian reserve on campus. All they did was say the campus, they stopped mining gravel out of the creek and declared it a riparian reserve. It looked really awful, but it was, it, that's where you start, right? It was because of student demands, by the way. Um, and then uh, the Pewter Creek Council formed in 1988, designed to be a very innocuous organization to pick up trash and to get the, help the landowners take care of their, their land along the creek. But then we had a drought which really pushed things uh, very severely, uh, drying up the creek at times. Then in 1996, there was a lawsuit to restore the flows. And then in 2000, there was a settlement agreement. And really, this period here, 1996 to 2000, that, that's, that's sort of the inflection point where things really started to change. Uh, and indeed, uh, and uh, I must admit, the earlier one, though, was Monticello Dam built in 1957. You can't go back. Once you've done that, once you've gotten rid of the, the, the natural flow regimes and the natural system, you really can't go back. Um, and so here's the Peter Creek Diversion Dam, which is about uh, eight miles downstream from Monticello Dam, sending most of the water into Solano County and even a small remnant uh, in Peter Creek. So this is a very, uh, very altered stream. Uh, there's very few streams that are this straight and that are confined between levees like Peter Creek is, yet that seemed to work reasonably well. And, and this is despite this long history of abuse. Uh, this is a picture I took in 1991 of, you know, there's lots of, this is the Detroit riprap, you know, the classic way of disposing of old cars. <laughs> you dump it, throw it in a stream to stabilize the banks. And the university mined gravel out of the creek for a long time for university roads. So it was, that was general reflection of general abuse that the creek got. Uh, this is 1988, more sweet just drying up, you know, 
stagnant, a pretty depressing place. But nevertheless, there are some of us, even back then, could see it had possibilities. But people didn't get motivated to do much about the creek until the drought, the got, drought got really severe in 1999 and 1990, when the creek dried up and even catfish died. Uh, here's, a, here's a beaver dam that's uh, completely, out, completely dried up. The creek basically dried up and all these natural values that were sort of developing because while the creek had been neglected, Peter Creek Council was taking some of the car bodies out and it started to look better. Some of the plants were coming back, it started to look better. A few more birds were appearing. Uh, then, then it dries up and everything seems to be going to hell. So uh, that's where people start getting angry. And that resulted in a lawsuit. Um, and the most amazing thing about this lawsuit is that while it was led by the Peter Creek Council, the city of Davis and the University of California joined in the lawsuit. To have a university join a lawsuit to get more water down the creek was just downright astonishing. It said a lot about the administration at that time. Um, and, but their argument was this was important for teaching and research. Um, and there, there was a, say, a lawsuit against the Solano Water Agency in the Sacramento Superior Court and the settlement agreement uh, in, in the year 2000. And the data, the, the, I said citizens collected the data that was essential for the lawsuit. I should say citizens and students because a lot of the student data was used for the lawsuit as well. But the legal issues focused on providing flows for native fishes. We had the good luck that this had been a formal gravel pit right below the diversion dam, but the vegetation had grown up in it, so it looked pretty good. And for some reason, 10 species of native fish managed to survive in this area. So we had a seed bank of, of the native species, a little fish refuge. Uh, the, the, the settlement agreement got basically said that we have to keep the creek from drying up. We get spring flows for the native fish spawning and rearing. Uh, we get fall attraction flows for the salmon. And then we'll, but we'll leave high flows up to uh, uh, unusual events, dam spills, and so forth. But so these are the three things that we got out of, out of the lawsuit. And that was a lot, because suddenly we had guarantees that this could be a living ecosystem. Um, this is the Peter Creek Accord. Uh, everybody's looking very good. This is Joe Cravoza, by the way, who's currently running for our local political office. Um, and so Pewter Creek today then became, is a conservation and community resource. It really is. There's a lot going on in the creek. The landowners are very proud of what, do, what the creek, uh, there's lots of citizen involvement on what's going on uh, along the creek. Uh, so what does it take to manage this creek as a reconciled ecosystem? Well, first off, it takes fairly bold vision. Uh, and indeed, the accord the, uh, that followed the um, a trial was a, was a visionary statement. It's the one that where the, the Pewter Creek Council, the university, all the various representatives sat down and figured out what do we want. Uh, and the best part about it was it was the flow regime. That was the key because without that, you don't have anything else. But it also said the water agency would pay for monitoring of the fish and wildlife. And, and it said that there was a general agreement that the creek should be restored to a, a healthier environment. That, that was a pretty big vision right there. Um, but then you have all these other things that were needed. They had to have the appropriate flow regime, water agency cooperation, the stream keeper, and so forth. And I'll go through these one at a time. The whole, the whole, in other words, a whole bunch of things have to work to, to make this a reconciled system. Uh, another part of the bold vision, you have to, if you, if you have, when you have the right people around, you can do this. This is an example. This is the winter, with the, uh, uh, it's sometimes called the ecology park in downtown Winters. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's still being constructed. And this was the vision um, uh, for this park to recreate the channel of Peter Creek. This is a bunch of old cement dams which had to be taken out first. Uh, a very uns it's unsafe. What, one of the motivation factors is that this is an unsafe place for kids. So people figured, let's make it safe and make it a, into an ecological park at the same time. Uh, but the amazing thing is to do this, you had to start from scratch, including putting the creek in these pipes while all the construction was going on. This, again, just took vision. And then, then the fish that were left behind, there were a lot of native fish in here. They had to be rescued. We had, those of us who got out there got, had a great time, <laughs> as you can tell. Uh, but this is what happened. The, the original system looked like this. It doesn't look too bad, actually, because of the, of the trees and so forth. But these are, there's all kinds of issues here. But this is what it looks like today. Um, little, this is about a year ago. So, but you can see there's a natural channel. There's, these are all native plants that have been planted. It's an issue. It's, it's a, the creek is, is becoming more like a natural creek there. And best of all, uh, it's accessible to, um, 
uh, the, the citizens of winters, and they, part of it they take the fifth grade classes, go down to the creek at, for, for for study. So and it's available; it's there. You can do it. Um, well, of course, another essential part of any reconciled ecosystem is community involvement. The Cuda Creek Council exemplifies this. Uh, every every little thing that goes on at the creek, where there's some change that we need labor, need volunteers, Peter Creek Council does it. Um, uh, planting trees and so forth. This is my daughter and granddaughter, so I had to throw that in too. Um, but the, the another thing is uh, water agency cooperation. Uh, m remember, we had this trial, and we, th it, was, it was a nasty trial in lots of ways with the water agency versus the environmental groups. The water agency now, the Solano Water, has become one of the good guys. They are, they are really, I think they saw that there's no point in fighting this so let's do the best we job we can, and they are. Uh, they, they, they are a strong supporter of most of the actions in the creek. They still get 95% of the water, but there's, they could doing everything else they can as well. So, and it would not be, if they weren't a willing cooperator, it'd be a lot harder. Uh, and this is one of the more important things. This is Rich Merovich. This is uh, our speaker last time right here when we were out. This is Rich Merovich. This is uh, Becca Canonia is one of my uh, postdocs. Um, we were out on the creek, took, took um, Michael uh, on a tour of the creek, and one of the persons I had to have him meet was Rich Merovich. He's a stream keeper, a almost unique position in terms of this is part of the agreement, settlement agreement, that the Solano Water Agency would pay the salary of a stream keeper. Rick's job is to take care of the creek. That, that plan I showed you for restoring the park in winters, that's largely his doing. He's the one who went out and found the million, couple million dollars to do that, that, that project. And that's what his job is. He, he's a, we have a full-time person who's caring for the creek. That makes a huge difference. Uh, and he, above all, he's a dip, but his main job is as a diplomat. He's the person who talks to the landowners because there are over 100 landowners along the creek. It's mostly, most of the creek banks in private hands. So that means you need somebody who can talk to landowners, and he can do that. Uh, and then, of course, there's monitoring and research. Uh, as Melanie pointed out very nicely, all of the research and monitoring that's been going on with birds, mammals, and so forth, and we've been doing it for the fish uh, as well. Uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. We know a lot more about Peter Creek than most streams in California. So the question becomes then, is this a model for other watersheds? There's a lot of, you know, we have a lot of unique things going on here with the university, with the educated populace, with willing landowners, but a lot of this developed too. It didn't happen overnight, it developed. Uh, so we like to think it's a model for other watersheds. And the biggest test of this is going on right now in the San Joaquin River Basin, where there's not such willing landowners and so forth. But uh, as you may or may not be aware, it's 150 miles of the San Joaquin River that's been dry, or larger than that, that's being restored to, um, uh, to a living river again. Uh, and they, or they're, they're, right, they're planting salmon up here almost as we speak. But this is the vision for this river. You have spring run and fall run Chinook salmon in this section of the river, then on the valley floor a section for native resident fish, then mainly non-native fish down here as the water gets warm. But this, is, this, this, this big project, you know, somewhere between 400 and 800 million dollar project is based in part on what we did on Pewter Creek. So there, there is hope. So, so at this point, uh, I have some conclusions that picture disappeared. So, Melanie, do you want to <laughs> start with your, your conclusions? Um, yes, I guess the thing that strikes me most um, as an ecologist about this whole process and system is that uh, species interactions are what drive evolution, pretty much. And what we have here is a system in which we've got brand new species interactions happening between invasive species, native species, new combinations of species, new environment. And it makes one wonder what sorts of evolutionary processes are occurring or could occur in a system like this and what, what's driving these, these sort of changes and maybe there's rapid evolution happening here and not other places. And it, so it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for students and, and professors and researchers to to apply some of these questions to the creek and, and to take a look at what's going on out there and use it as a, as a springboard for, for, for you know, research and as well as education 
And, uh, and there's a lot of really great projects going on right now on the uh, creek and in the, in the environment around the creek, too. There's a whole active working landscapes group that are looking at the matrix, the agricultural matrix, and how it interacts with some of these waterways, and sl the sloughs that we have in this area and the creek itself, and hedgerows that exist between uh, fields and connectivity that occurs between all those different habitat elements. So there's a lot going on, a lot more that could go on. So I guess that's sort of my conclusion at this point. Yeah, and, and of course that's a reflection of the fact we, we had the good fortune to have a university here. But I still think this is a model that could be used elsewhere. Um, and I think the key elements that you see here is this idea of people getting together at the very beginning and figuring out what they want. That's what reconciliation means, getting diverse people together and then deciding what it is you want. And increasingly, there's, there's the idea that, it, that you want to protect native flora and fauna. Uh, and one of the very mo good motivations for doing this is that people want to avoid having species listed as threatened or endangered, because once the the big arm of the Endangered Species Act comes down and you, your options get greatly reduced. And one of the good things about Pewter Creek, at least initially, was that there are no endangered fish in it. These are all fish that, that were relatively common, uh, even though they're native fish. So we didn't have any Endangered Species Act issues. And the fact that it, we got the recovery going to the creek without endangered species is quite remarkable. We do have a few uh, uh, endangered birds and things along the creek, but by and large, uh, it's still being managed without that, that big driver as, the, as a reconciled ecosystem that works in a landscape because people want it to work. And I think that's what the big model is that uh, we have to keep, keep looking forward. And that's hard because it means you're getting, trying to get people together, you're getting people to work with very diverse points of view to work together. Um, and I, my, that's also why I think the stream keeper is so important. Because you have, firstly, if you have one person who's like Rich, who's a good diplomat, and who's also, been, he's always been around for a number of years, so he's a fixture on the landscape. People know him. We would hope he never leaves because uh, he's so the glue that holds it all together. That's very important to have one person who's actually making a living, de dedicated to the creek, raising money for projects, talking to people, making sure uh, everything works. So it's a, it's a very positive experience, and I hope it can be repeated elsewhere. So at this stage, we'll be happy to take questions. Questions? Comments? Jay. Who pays for the stream keeper? Uh, so, uh, Solano Water Agency. The, initially, he was paid as a half-time employee with half, half, half his salary raised from grants and things. Now he's full-time employee of the water agency which you could argue as maybe a conflict of interest there, but that's, uh, this that tells you that the water agency's really been very good about this. They've really been pretty hands off. Um, and so they hire and manage this, this person? Yeah, they, they, basically all his personnel stuff goes to the Sonoma County Water Agency, but he's very independent. But they like it because he keeps them informed of what's going on. No surprises from their perspective, which is important. Yeah. What other considerations do you take for the fact that the wastewater treatment plant on the creek and around? You oh, you mean the UC Davis? Yeah. Um, I haven't been keeping up with that recently, but most of that is no longer going into the creek. Um, I should be careful what I say because I don't know. I know during the drought, it actually kept the creek alive on campus. <laughs> but yeah, oh yeah. The, 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 what, even back then in the, in the dark ages in the 1980s, the effluent coming out of the sewage treatment plant was uh, enough to keep, the, uh, keep fish alive. And it couldn't have been too bad because my son used to sneak off and go swimming in it. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how he survived. But he was a kid. He was a boy. You said at the beginning that reconciliation ecology gets away from restoration, moves away from yeah. from of restoration, yet what I saw in your presentation or, or, or that there are many elements of restoration. Oh, sure. Bringing flows in, planting native vegetation. So what really is the difference between restoration and reconciliation? You want to try to answer that, Melanie? Or so I guess restoration in the classical context is trying to take the system back to some previous pristine historic condition, restoring it back. 
Whereas reconciliation is saying, this is what we have. It's never going to go back to what it originally was, whatever set point you're looking at, because they vary. Um, so this is what we've got, and, and we're reconciled that humans are using it, wildlife are using it, everyone's using this system. How can we make this system work, function most effectively for all the parties involved? Yeah, I think the word ecosystem function is really important because that's what's going on here. We're trying to get a functioning ecosystem, even though it contains native and non-native species. But the, but the flow regimes illustrate if you're smart, and you really, especially if you have data so you know what you're doing, you can manipulate the environment in ways that favor the natives. But don't get rid of the non-natives. They're still there. And the whole idea of you, you, you don't assume your endpoint is some fictitious time in the past when everything was perfect, but your endpoint is what you want it to be. You, you, if, and, and restoration uh, on Pewter Creek may well involve a whole suite of non-native plants. Uh, certainly the non-native fish are not going to go away, so they've got to be part of the system so you figure out how do you accommodate them. And maybe how do you get rid of the most pestiferous plants? For example, in plants, there's a lot of money being spent on arundo control. And the reason for that is that arundo, false bamboo or, or what, uh, re giant reed, I guess, uh, it's, it's, it just takes over the edge of the riparian system and, and uh, eliminates a lot of more desirable plants. So there, it's worth it to go after the individual plants using herbicides and everything else. But you make a choice. And then there are other non-native plants you don't worry about so much. Uh, and I think that's part of it. You say those, those plants, those are guest species. We'll let them, <laughs> let them be part of the system. <laughs> But we're in charge. That's part of the thing. We are in charge, and you're trying to create a system that's as sustainable as possible. That result doesn't require huge effort every time you go out and try to do something. Is there a question here? Do you think the process would have gotten as far as it has like a lawsuit? I'm sorry, with that the. Without a lawsuit? Um, I said, but, but could this process have taken place without the lawsuit? Um, Maybe Melanie has a better response. I'll just I'll give you my response real quickly. I think it was, it was a tipping point. It was really key. Um, I think a lot of this would have gone on but even without the lawsuit. The university had already had a reserve. The Peter Creek Council was formed. But that water was what got the creek system. You know, it got the trees growing. It got the fish growing. Mm -hmm. So did you? And I think without the mandated funds for monitoring, we wouldn't know nearly what we know now. And most of the, a lot of the work I do would not have ever been done. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of students' support would have been lacking. So I think it really did yeah, it, put it, teeth into the whole process. What the lawsuit did and the settlement was to accelerate everything and also to get everybody together at one time. Because once that law, you know, everybody had gotten together and suing each other and being angry at one another. Once the settlement agreement occurred, there was the general feeling we got to make something out of this, and we've got we've got this mess here. Let's make something out of it. So um, it's almost as you have to you have to really get have fight for a while before you can have peace. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, it's, I think it's amazing how much you've been able to do with such a small amount of water in proportion to what yeah. can actually be there in this particular <coughs> creek. But you have other there are other ecosystems like the big one that you're everyone talked about all the time the delta where sure. which is being uh, you know they're trying to manage it intensively target the water to uh, specific periods of time and the fish aren't responding so what what <laughs> happens when reconciliation uh, ecology fails what then well it, it you know it, it it's, you're going to have a, have an ecosystem out there regardless uh, so the delta is a classic place the South Delta has almost no native plants or animals in it, it seems. Uh, it's still a reconciled ecosystem because we're, it's, it, it's, it's working in some respects, and we could try to change it. And the problem with the Delta, it's so altered. This is, and this gets into, the, into your definitions of trying to figure out what you do. When you get to a place like the Delta that's so altered, can you pick and choose the species and pick and choose the areas that you work in? The North Delta, for example, the Cache Creek region, um, has a lot of po very positive attributes that make it possible to, if you get more water in there especially, you're likely to have more responses from the native fish. If you try to do that in elsewhere in the Delta, you may not have those responses. I think the increasing the work that's been done recently uh, by the San Francisco Estuary Institute and others really do suggest 
that the delta is not just one place, it's multiple places. And that's why you've got to treat, treat each place differently as a different system and maybe have different goals for it. I know I'm sort of going around your question, but uh, it's not an easy one to answer. That water, water alone is never enough. Even in Pewter Creek, water was, we, it was really great the way it worked out, but water by itself would not have, was not enough. We had to have all these other things going on at the same time. But that's what gave the motivation to make it work. Well, time's up, right? Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how do you see an industry as big as agriculture in Miller County intersecting with the reconciliation policy? Melanie, you can probably answer that better um, than I can. So, do we see agriculture embracing reconciliation ecology and interacting? Certainly, um, there are there are groups within the larger agricultural milieu that, that do a lot of the organic farmers, the sustainable agriculture people. Uh, I'm thinking specifically about the farm on Puda Creek, which is run by Craig McNamara. He's done, and also John Anderson, who hedgerow farms. Uh, and these folks have um, looked forward, taken forward thinking approaches to agriculture and have uh, installed tailwater ponds to collect runoff, for example, to treat. To, they've installed uh, hedgerows for wildlife values and looking at pollinator interactions between native areas and agricultural areas and trying to limit pesticides, trying to use um, beneficial insects and beneficials. And so there are, there's these, these factions within the larger. And I think that they're, they're becoming more and more vocal and more and more important uh, as time goes on and they move into positions of power and they start to take over the the running of things. Yeah, you have so, to recognize yeah. that, that that all the large landowners along the creek are farmers. Um, and those farmers by and large did not start out being necessarily friends of the creek, but by and large they are now. Uh, they're pretty responsible for what they're doing. Um, and again, I think that's sort of the evolution that's taken place, it's partly as they saw that reconciliation and this idea of bringing the creek back was not a threat, but actually a positive thing. They became much more active in, in protecting the creek. Now, it's quite remarkable, actually. Yeah, Chris? Has the Solano County or Solano Irrigation District incorporated its success story into its PR? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a really good question. They should because they've been a very, a very positive force in this whole business. But I, no, I don't know. Except they call themselves what, Blue Water for Green Power or something like so that. And they, have, they have something green in their, with their motto now. Uh, so maybe this is part of it. But yeah, but to me, that's something that they should be doing because it's, uh, they, they have been, been a very positive force. Yeah. Other than environmental, what other benefits or incentives do the farmers have to work with you in restoring the reconciling the ecosystem? You know, uh, do you have a good answer? I could say pollinators is one. Right. One thing that springs to mind is uh, water rights and um, <coughs> extractions from the creek. The people that live along the creek have various types of water rights and they can pull water from the creek. And a lot of the farmers do get their, their irrigation water from the creek. So one of the, um, the things that was important during the lawsuit was to guarantee those water rights from people who were maybe taking diversions that they weren't entitled to. So by establishing this oversight and the stream keeper and all the activities that are going on to benefit the environment and benefit wildlife, it's also coming hand in hand with uh, these the guaranteed water rights and protection of people's water rights. So I think some of the farmers are are gaining from that. Some of them are not. Some of the illegal diverters are not so happy. Um, but there's uh, it's um, you know more guarantees for all perhaps. But I think there is this also this attitude for a lot of these farmers. They do want to demonstrate they're the good guys that you know that that agriculture is not all bad. Um, and I know some of them love pointing out that that Swainson's hawks forage on their land, uh, and, it's, and, and especially in alfalfa fields and things of this nature. So there's a, um, I think part of the, what's going on is the farmers are doing it because they want to do it. Um, there are other motivations, but certainly just the fact it's a good thing to do is, is yeah. part of it. 
think a lot of the agriculturists have a really strong land ethic and environmental ethic. They live on the land. It, it's their livelihood. It's their, their soul. And they, they, they do seem that. You know, it has to work economically, but if they can make it you know, win-win for everybody. Of course, one reason the creek is so important is you go away from the creek, you see less and less habitat. You, those of you know Yolo County know there are very few hedgerows, very few. The, the fields are back-to-back -back with one another. There's not much wildlife habitat in the landscape, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons that Peter Creek come, becomes even more important. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe that, those shreds will spread out between fields someday. Yeah, yeah, I hope uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. Are you at all worried that there might be um, a sort of perversion of reconciliation ecology in the name of like um, deriving more ecosystem services from an anthropogenic view instead of like um, reconciliating, doing it for uh, ecosystem function for biodiversity? Yeah, that the, the question was, aren't you? Are we afraid that? that reconciliation ecology can be perverted essentially as a way to try to really just to accept the status quo. Uh, that's usually the way it's, it's stated. Uh, and that is a worry because obviously you can see if you say you're doing reconciliation ecology and you really, uh, and you don't have a firm, firm goal in mind of restoring native species or something like this, that it could be abused. Uh, and that's one of the main criticisms that, that Rosenzweig gets is that you're just fronting for the developers uh, because you're, you're saying the humans are, have to have, be in the landscape uh, and that we don't necessarily have to do large scale restoration. Uh, what, what the argument back is, is that restoration and preservation really don't work. And so we're, this is what we're forced into. Um, but yeah, it's a worry. I, I agree that you, you do have to be concerned about it, it being perverted. But you know, reconciliation is such a great word. You know, it's such a positive word. <laughs> That's one of the reasons that I think, I, and, and, and Rosenzweig says himself, it's sort of, it's, it's, he worked hard finding that word, and he said it's sort of, sort of, sort of ambiguous <laughs> for that reason. And he hopes that good people will use it in positive ways, right? Yeah. I'm very interested in this. Well, the creek effort sort of grew out of a local community in the watershed it seems. Mm -hmm. Whereas some of the other efforts um, are coming out of people from outside of the basin using state and federal laws to change operations. Do you see that sort of local political motivation uh, and attention being important to have a successful reconciliation? And it, could it be done by as effectively by, say, uh, a state agency implementing 5937 uh, on, on some watershed that doesn't necessarily have a lot of people in it, but might have a lot of impact. Um, I can, you, you want to try that? Okay. Um, the San Joaquin River is a good example of that, actually. That was a top-down action based on a lawsuit. And again, it's using 5937, the Fishing Game Code, the same basis for the, for the Pewter Creek uh, settlement. Um, and you know, the San Joaquin Valley uh, was mainly farmers and the small towns, fire bounds over many farm workers. There's not a big constituency for a living river in that environment. Um, now, though, that, that there's this, been this court-ordered settlement, there's a, a growing group. There, there, there already was a small group, local group, along the r river right, uh, right at Fryant in that area, trying to restore the parts of the San Joaquin as you know, bike trails and things of this nature. That group, that constituency has been growing. As the potential for the river become more obvious to people, then, the, then that constituency develops. But it started out as a top-down action with very little local support. The congressman, local congressman, vehemently so opposed to it. So it's amazing it got going, which says something about the power of that law. But in Mao, it's, I, I see there's a, you know, newsletters, there's all kinds of other stuff out there. People enjoying the creek, the, the, you know, kayaks on the creek where, you couldn't, where there's no water before. That's, that, that, that's a big difference. And now birds and everything else are coming back, too. So, you had a question there? Yeah, I was wondering, you were talking a lot about the farmers. Are they mostly um, like small farmers, or is, are people people in creeks more like corporation size? Both. Yeah. Mix 
like the Marianis who do the nuts, dried nuts and dried fruit and nuts, they have a lot of land. So they're kind of a medium size enterprise, but then there's smaller, you know, mom and pop kind of farms and then there's sort of kind of a, a mishmash. There's not any real big corporate Type. Well, except so there's there? one, one section of land that's opposite from Russell Ranch where the university is land that's owned by the Catholic Church. Right, right. Yeah. So there <laughs> that's you a big go. corporation. So. <laughs> but they're pretty good. They're very cooperative, yeah, actually. Even God farms the creek. So. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Yeah. This is sort of more of a comment, but you, you mentioned Poudre Creek as sort of an example of what can be achieved elsewhere as a model. And, I think it's also a model of sort of how science and policy can work mm -hmm. together. And you know, here we are in a room full of people at the dawn of their scientific careers. And I just think it's really important to point out that if you have good data, you do unimpeachable science, you can advocate for something that you want to achieve if you keep those two things separate. And sure. um, you know, that's something that, that really worked here and I think, you know, People in this room will, are probably already working throughout the state and you know the nation and the world. But as they do that throughout their careers, you all have an opportunity to to make good things happen. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, although you know it's it's and and that's what's going to keep Creative Creek going. But you know when we first started out, when the lawsuit was going, the data we didn't have that much data. Uh, you had most of it. Yeah, I fish. had most of the data on the fish, and that was mostly student collected data. And, you know, I still remember sitting there in the courtroom at being, you know, before being cross-examined, you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, and you've been being asked questions about what's going to happen to Peter Creek if they provide this water. I said, the native fish will come back. You know, I had to <laughs> <laughs> be careful when I said, yeah. <laughs> But I was reasonably sure, and I, you know, my sci I'd done enough, enough science around the state to be reasonably certain that would happen. But that is one of the problems you run into <laughs> with science versus the courtroom. You, you always, if you're a scientist, you always have uncertainty. Mm. And fortunately, you had an it worked. Honest face. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, it worked. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So, Peter, just a comment. Mm -hmm. Good science and data are essential. Without it, you can't move forward. Yeah. But even with good data and science, if there, so I'm coming back to something you said, if there's a threat to the people, to the stakeholders, the landowners, you can't move forward either. There's just continuous conflict. Yeah. So when you talked about reconciliation ecology, what you said about reducing threats, or it, it, it does not, reconciliation ecology does not pose a threat to those who have stakeholders stake right. in the area where it's been done. It's just so important. Yeah, yeah and that's why this, again, the street keeper is so important. That's what one of Rick's jobs does is to go around and, and talk to people, to reassure them that this is not going to this is this is not going to be that all that bad, uh, or reassure them that this is going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you definitely need that for sure. Just reflecting on that, has there been any documentation of the impact on SIDE's bottom line? I mean, they were the yeah they right. were going up against the new quarter. I don't know. Uh, you know, I've, they've obviously lost some water on it, but you know, it's five percent of the project yield is what the water costs are in Peter Creek, and some of that water's uh, regained as they get further down the river, uh, and it's taken up by farmers even down in the Yellow Bypass. Mm -hmm. So, in a in a sense, in terms of the loss to agriculture, it's quite a bit less. But what? But as far as SID's bottom line is, uh, I don't know. There, I'm certain there's been some loss. Though there may be some gain as well, because I know, as a, uh, I mentioned, the uh, Pleasants Creek tributary is a major source of fine sediment. They actually had to close down some of their pumps on the Puda South Canal because there was so much fine sediment that had been eroded out of that watershed and into the, the domestic water supply. It cost them a lot of money. So now what they're doing is trying to focus some of this restoration toward uh, stabilizing those banks, laying them back, putting new, you know, basically reconciling that ecosystem so they can save money down the road. So I think there is a potential, uh, a great potential for them to actually save money by instituting these ecosystem friendly sort of practices. So you had a question? Uh, you, you had a comment? No. 
Now, in your mind, uh, which would have greater impacts in restoring the uh, ecological function within, within the stream channel? Uh, adding another 50 feet of riparian or, or buffer on either side, or adding another 500 acre feet of water down the stream bed? Oh, no. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> seem to be getting all the tricky questions. <laughs> Well, that's a really good question, actually, and yeah. I would say both, but um, because I do the terrestrial <laughs> part, I would really love to see some riparian buffers put in, uh, some of these marginal lands adjacent to the creek that really aren't being farmed actively. Uh, could mean so much to the riparian ecosystem. It's so narrow, <coughs> and there's so much incursion from the matrix, dust, solar, um, cowbirds, you name it. Uh, would really help buffer that interior environment. So I, if I had to vote for one, I'd vote for the, the buffers. And but, but the problem we have with that is that the creek is really deeply incised. If you know Peter Creek, you know the, the, the creek channel is 20, 30 feet down from the, from the farm surface. So that anything, any additional habitat you'd create above on the, uh, you know, along the edge of the creek would have to be, you have to farm it essentially, you have to uh, plant trees and, and actively water them and everything else. So you, you could, could do it, but it would probably be pretty expensive. Yeah. yeah. Do you think they could lay the banks back a bit, maybe re-slope them? And That's an engineer, but boy, they're, they're, those banks, you, you know, if you've been down on Peter Creek, you know it's really incised. Uh, and it seems to me moving any dirt around down there would be really be difficult. But, you know, this, yeah. day, this world, anything's possible, right? Right. Well, that's what Rich is kind of doing with yeah. some of his restoration. Not maybe to that yeah. degree, but certainly borrowing yeah. soil from one area and moving it somewhere else. But that also gets back to where more water would be, not, would, would be especially helpful if you actually could increase the, the channel width down in the lower creek. So you have more place for the fish to spread out. And in fact, this is actually pretty exciting. The landowners are doing that. Right below the Peter, Peter Creek Diversion Dam, there's four or five landowners that are all working together with the streamkeeper. And they, this is an area that had been heavily covered with sediment from released from the dam. And they now removed a lot of that sediment, which is actually really nice soil, lowered the surface of this area, which has big trees in it, mostly cottonwoods uh, uh, and oaks. They've, they've lowered the surface area there and created a floodplain where one has not existed for uh, uh, a long 100 years probably. It's going to be very interesting if we ever get, get rain again <laughs> uh, to see if that, that will, will flood. It's designed to flood. So they're trying, and that's the, play, that's the kind of place, of course, if you had more water in the creek uh, so you could flood it more often would probably be really beneficial. But yeah, so there, these, the water and the environment, physical environment, are always interacting. That it? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank